macroeconomic equilibrium. This video will focus on the neoclassical long-run aggregate supply equilibrium. But before we get there, a few little things that I just want to make sure you mention so that you understand. And just a reminder that the actual level of output and its corresponding price level in an economy are determined by the interaction between aggregate demand and aggregate supply. And so we've been building towards this moment throughout our, our studies of aggregate demand and aggregate supply. And finally, we're going to put these two uh, curves together. So simply put, the equilibrium level of national income is where aggregate demand is equal to aggregate supply. And we know this. But as we also know, economists distinguish between a short-run and a long-run aggregate supply curve, and therefore we'll have two different equilibriums, one in the short-run and one in the long-run. I thought it'd be useful very quickly just to take a look at the short-run equilibrium output in that the economy in the short run is in equilibrium where aggregate demand equals aggregate short run the short run aggregate supply curve. So here's the short run aggregate supply curve, here is the 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 intersect here's the intersect, but here is the aggregate demand curve. And of course in the short run, the 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 economy is working at a point where P uh, at price level P and at an output level of Y. So graphically, it looks very much like the short one equilibrium for a particular market. But of course, the labels on the axes are very different. The economy is in short run equilibrium where aggregate demand equals short run aggregate supply, producing a level, producing an output level of Y, as I just said, and a price level of P. The output produced by the economy is exactly equal to the total demand in the economy. And so there's no reason for producers to change their level of output. Because aggregate demand is equal to aggregate supply, there's no upward or downward pressure on the price level, there's no inflation, there's no deflation, and therefore um, nothing changes unless we shift, of course, one of these curves, either aggregate demand outward, or for some reason aggregate supply in the short run shifts outward or inward. So that's the short run equilibrium. And now, which is the, but the focus of this video is really on understanding the long run equilibrium point. Um, and we'll start off, in, in this case, with the new, the neoclassical perspective. According to this perspective, or neoclassical economists, the economy will always move towards its long-run equilibrium point at, full of, at the full employment level. And this is represented, of course, once again, by YF here on our graph. Thus, the long-run equilibrium is where aggregate demand curve meets the vertical long-run aggregate supply curve, as you see here. The impact of any changes in aggregate demand, in other words, if we shift aggregate demand outward, the impact on that will be only inflationary. It'll only be a change in price because this is a perfectly inelastic um, demand curve, or rather supply curve, and any change in, in aggregate demand out there to AD2 will only be reflective in not an increase in output, as you might expect, but simply a rise in prices. It's also valuable to look at the adjustment from the short run to the long run in order to understand the new classical perspective. The Keynesian and new classical economists agree on the shape of the short run aggregate curve, but as we know, the new classical economists argue that the economy will always move automatically to its long run equilibrium. The, the word automatically in the last sentence means without any government intervention and illustrates the significance that the neoclassical economists place on free markets. In their view, there may be a short-run increase in output, but if there's an increase in aggregate demand, it, but it, output, if there's an increase in aggregate demand, but the economy will always return to the long-run equilibrium point. You can see this best if you take a look. So on this graph here, figure 16.4, what you see is the aggregate demand has shifted outward. We have a combination of the long-run aggregate supply curve right, which is represented here by the black line, and the short-run aggregate supply curve. And in the neoclassical perspective, showing a combination of the short and the long run, which is illustrated here, initially the economy is at its long-run equilibrium. It's operating right here. But if there's an increase in aggregate demand, a shift from A1 to A2 due to changes in any of the components of aggregate demand, C plus I plus G plus X minus M, then, in the short run, there will be an increase in output from YF to Y1. In this case, the economy would be experiencing what is known as an inflationary gap, which is a key economic term, which is where the, the economy is in, is in equilibrium at a level of output that is greater than the full employment level of output. So the new equilibrium point 
is functioning out here. And you can see very clearly that as a result of that, there's going to be an increase in price as a result of increased demand. We have an outward shift of demand. However, according to the New Classical Economist, this is only possible in the short run. It is possible for output to increase along the short-run aggregate supply curve by paying existing workers overtime wages as a short-term solution. But as the economy is originally at, full, at the full employment level, there are no unemployed resources. The long-run aggregate supply curve is going to win in the end. So in their effort to increase the output, the firms in the economy are competing for increasing scarce labor. And the best way to think about that is, you know, increase wages. And therefore, they're also going to be competing for capital. And as the diagram shows, the increase in aggregate demand results in an increase in the price level. So the increase... And you can take a look at that increase in the price level. We can use similar analysis to see what happens if aggregate demand falls. Take a look at this graph here. Originally, the economy was at its long-run equilibrium where AD1 intersected SRS, right? Same thing. We're back here. It was the original equilibrium point was operating right here. And then, as a result of fall in aggregate demand from A1 to A2, that might be as a result of any of the components of aggregate demand falling, it results in a fall in the level of national output from YF to Y1, right there. And therefore, decrease in the price level, as you can see. So the, the, price, the decrease in price level is here. We have a situation of deflationary pressure on prices as a result of an inward shift to the aggregate demand curve because one of the factors of aggregate demand, C plus I plus G plus X minus M, have changed. In this case, the economy would be experiencing what is known as a deflationary gap. It's a big term. The significance of what? Or the, the, the significance, significance of it isn't there, but um, we'll be defining that, which is defined as where the economy is in equilibrium at a level of output that is less than the full employment level of output. So if aggregate demand shrinks, we have a fall in the price level, we have a fall in output. But remember, this is <laughs> the short run.
So in the short run, the economy will produce at a less than full employment level. However, this deflationary gap will not persist. Why? Because in the end, friends, the long run wins. The fall in the price means that the price of the economy's factors of production have fallen. And therefore, we will see a change in the... We'll see an, a, an outward shift in supply as a result of decreased costs. So this is shown here, which means that the firm's cost of production fall, and this results in a shift of the short-run aggregate supply curve from SRAS1 to SRAS2. As the diagram shows, the economy returns to its long run, surprise, surprise, its long run aggregate supply equilibrium at full employment level of output, but at a lower price level, represented here by P3. The diagrams and explanations illustrate the new classical perspective and that is of the long-run equilibrium in the economy. What is important is the, is the conclusion, and this is key, listen to this, that the long-run equilibrium level of output is equal to the full employment level of income and that the economy will move towards equilibrium without any government intervention as a result of market forces. What this is saying is no matter what happens to demand, in the end, short run, the change in demand will change, have an impact on the short run aggregate supply curve, and in the end, you'll end up operating, assume, assuming you can get back to it, um, where you're the, the, you'll be op the economy will be operating right along here at the long run aggregate supply curve. According to this model, an increase in aggregate demand will be purely inflationary in the long run, and thus is no, there is no role for government to play in trying to deliberately steer the economy towards full employment. Although there may be deviations from full employment in the short run, new classical economists would not see a role for the government in filling these gaps. They would recommend leaving the economy to market forces rather than using government policies to manage the level of aggregate demand. And that is a fundamental difference. There is no belief in the monetarists, the supply side economists, the neoclassicists, the Austrian, Austrian school, they do not believe that the government should get involved. They say that a decrease in demand from will ultimately lead maybe to a short some short run pain, but ultimately lower costs if if of production will create downward pressure on supply. And as a result, you'll see an outward shift of aggregate supply because of the decrease in costs to producers. So there you have it, the neoclassical perspective on the long-run macroeconomic equilibrium, which of course also incorporates the short-run aggregate supply curve.